Good morning, let's get started. Last time we talked about the word falsifiable and how it's actually a good thing in science. Let's do some review on that. If you forgot your voting card today, please raise your hand and we will have one of the LAs bring you a spare to borrow for today. Just leave it at the front when you go so we don't run out of spares. Or you could leave it at the back when you go. And just remember to bring your voting card every day. Anyone need to borrow one? Okay, prepare your cards. Three, two, one, vote. All right, looks like we're at about 80%, and I see a few people not voting. I'll ask the LAs to deliver voting cards if you're not voting so that you can. And I'd like you to turn to your partner, neighbor, scoot over if you don't have a near neighbor, and try to come to consensus on an answer and we'll see if we can get to 100% on the next vote in 30 seconds, go. About 10 more seconds. Three, prepare your cards. Okay, let's talk at the break. Yep, yep. Okay. You can grab a card. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Three, two, one, vote. Okay. Much better. We're close to 100%, over 95%. What is the letter of the correct answer? D. If it were false, that could be decisively shown. It doesn't mean that everything in science is false or falsified. It means falsifiable, able to be shown false if false. It doesn't mean everything's false. All right. Let's abbreviate that definition to a synonym. Prepare your cards. Three. Two, one, vote. All right, good. And now since it's just a single word instead of a phrase, go ahead and say the word that is the correct answer. Verifiable, Verifiable. checkable. In non-science contexts, perhaps falsifiable might be used in a completely different way, as in with falsified. That's not what it means in science. Science seeks to determine whether something is true or false, whether claims, explanations, and descriptions are true or false. Predictions as well, whether they will come true or turn out to be false. And some will turn out to be true, some will turn out to be false, and science can show that. If a claim is made that is so vague or just cannot possibly be checked because it's information that cannot be gathered, then that's uncheckable, unfalsifiable, and that is not the realm of science. That's sometimes pseudoscience. Most of the claims in pseudoscience are not checkable in the precise way that they are in science. And so that is a good thing for science trying to determine decisively the truth value of claims. And it's set up that claims, predictions made in science are not just checked once and then done, but checked again and again. The reason that we say falsifiable and not just verifiable, because verifiable is less likely to be misinterpreted, um, is that science is never done. Once a claim is verified, 
it's not just forever taken without question, experiments and tests can and should be repeated in science. They should be run independently by other groups of individuals and checked for mistakes. Uh, and when technology affords new ways of testing things or new predictions and new tests, then those new tests should be done. And the more times an explanation passes the tests it's put to, its predictions come true, the more it's believed, but it's never capital T true and never questioned again. Science finds errors and roots them out or corrects them by never being done with the testing. It's a rigorous process. So in a sense, verifiable is never completely done in science. We can't ever prove things true in a final way that we can prove them false. So that's why we tend to the word falsifiable with the risk of the misconception of how it's used in the common everyday speak. Okay, just wanted to revisit that term so we could avoid any confusion. And I wanted to draw your attention to an announcement on Canvas today, and if you're set up for notifications, you may have gotten this as an email as well, that the telescope activity is now open. And here is that announcement. It takes you to a link for more details and instructions. I can make my font a little bigger. And then I wanted to tell you why we assign the telescope activity. There's something about looking through a telescope. So I'm going to show you this three-minute YouTube video that I love. It tries to capture that thing about looking through a One telescope. Day I was bored in my apartment and decided to take my telescope out to the sidewalk. The moon was out and I thought, why not? Within a few minutes, people started walking over and asking what this thing was.
So that's why I'm going to make you look through a telescope. And you get to do it right from campus on the roof of Davy Lab, which is across the street from the hub. And for scheduling convenience, we can't ensure that there will be no clouds on a given night. By the way, that's a short link to that video if you want to make your friends watch it or whatever. Um, so if you come on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night, which are the nights when the activity is held and you get credit for going, and it's cloudy or too cold to go outside, like frostbite danger weather, we will actually have a planetarium show inside instead as an alternate. So if you go to the trouble of going to Davy Lab and it's not good viewing conditions, you can still do the activity. Planetarium's pretty cool too. It has the advantage of you won't freeze your ass off in January in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's um, never cloudy there. And in the planetarium, which is a projection of the sky on a curved ceiling, they can do fun things like speed up time and show you what things will look like in an hour, in a day, in a month, in 100 years. And they can also run time backwards and do some cool simulation stuff. But I think there's a special magic about the looking through the telescope. So if you want to check in advance whether the telescope will be open on a given Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night, if you prefer that over the planetarium, then there is uh, at that link on the announcement a place where you can check the status of the telescope. Will it be open or closed tonight? And if it's closed, you can just see the planetarium and get the, the credit out of the way and then just come back some clear night for fun just to see the telescope if you want. And the reason that we only hold the activity every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night and not Friday nights is that on Friday nights, the Astronomy Club uses the telescope for open house viewing just for the public. And so if you want to go just for fun and have nothing to do with this class or filling out a worksheet or getting credit, you can check their website to see if they're open on a given Friday night and, uh, and just go. That's during the semesters, not during the summers, and not during breaks. So all that you can find at that link for telescope status. I can't promise that, it, you, that the moon will be up in the sky at the right time for you to see it if you go on a given night. It might be in the wrong phase, and we're going to talk about the phases of the moon and when they're up in the sky or not. Sometimes they're up during the day. You saw the video showed them during the daytime pointing the telescope at the moon. It's one of the few celestial objects that we could actually see during the day the moon. And uh, so I can't promise that you will get to see the moon itself, but you will see something cool. You will actually see three somethings cool because the activity will have you look at two or three different things and you know, write some words about what you saw, sketch a picture and such. It's pretty easy. Hope it's fun. So that's all I wanted to say about the telescope activity. And then I'm going to move into our next topic on our to-do list. We'll start this with a question, and then I'll define the term on there. Would anybody like more time? OK, prepare your cards. Three, two, one, vote. OK, I'm seeing a, a total mix of answers here. Let me demonstrate with a globe here to see the answer. Um, the Earth spins on its axis. You all told me that last time. And the sun, over the course of the 24 hours it takes Earth to spin, we can pretty well treat as fixed in the sky because Earth orbits around it. And that orbit takes a year. And so over the course of 24 hours, Earth doesn't move very far in its orbit. So we can kind of ignore the orbital motion and just think about the spin motion. Now, from the perspective of an observer here on Earth, let's put them in the Northern Hemisphere here in North America, right on Pennsylvania. OK. So over the course of 24 hours, the sun is sometimes in the sky for this observer, 
And then some hours later, it's not in the sky anymore because it's nighttime and the sun is on the other side of the Earth, and so overhead is dark sky, not bright sky. So hopefully, many of us intuitively know that the rising and setting of the sun is caused by Earth spinning on its axis. So we know it's at least one. Uh, the stars are much farther away than the sun. You can imagine them as maybe the decorations on the walls of this room and maybe the walls of the other rooms around here if we could imagine the walls were transparent and we could see farther. The motions of those stars over the course of 24 hours is also negligible and so the observer standing still on a spinning earth will also see some of those stars like say the periodic table of the elements stars up on the wall over there will be overhead at some time or up in the sky at least on the same side of the earth as the observer is but then some hours later they'll be on the other side and so those uh, stars that were previously visible are now not those stars have set and then some hours later when the observer swings around here again those stars will now be visible again they will have risen so indeed stars do rise and set in our sky due to earth's rotation so it's true for stars it's true for sun it's also true for the moon i'm going to set down my um, earth now and think about the moon which also does orbit around the earth much like earth orbits around the sun the moon orbits around the earth but that takes much longer than a day and so over the course of 24 hours again the moon goes from being visible in the sky to not visible in the sky to visible again so it rises and sets due to earth's rotation its own orbital motion is negligible over the course of a day it's not zero but the rising and setting is primarily caused by earth's rotation what is a synonym for rotation spin yep so earth spin causes stars sun and moon to rise and set and galaxies the explanation is just going to be an extension literally of what we said for stars stars are much farther away than sun or moon or anything in our solar system so imagine things in the distance of this building the galaxies would be farther away still other buildings on campus or other cities and towns in Pennsylvania perhaps they're way out there somewhere and if you have a telescope or some ability to see them far away from earth the galaxies over there will sometimes be up in the sky on the same side of the earth as the observer and sometimes not so they will also rise and set everything in the sky at celestial cosmic distances rises and sets due to earth spin now it's not true of satellites or clouds satellites are orbiting earth and it only takes about 90 minutes to orbit earth and so that's their motion is their true motion going around earth and not earth spin and clouds those are blowing along with the breeze and so that's not earth spin but everything in astronomy astronomy related does rise and set due to earth spin let me simulate this for you there's a free program that i've downloaded on my laptop and some of the computer labs on campus have, but you can download on your home computer or laptop if you want. It's called Stellarium. Anybody used Stellarium before? It's a sky simulation, okay, not very many. Sky simulation software. And you can choose the time you want it to represent and the location on earth that the observer is located and I've got it set in State College now. So it's daytime, the sky is bright, but the sun is there in the sky, the moon and even the planet Venus are labeled here. Let's turn off the atmosphere, which will give us a beautiful view of the sky, although we're suffocating to death. It looks nice. All right, well, it's still daytime. You can see the sunlight shining on the ground here, but there were no atmosphere we would see the darkness of the sky beyond because the atmosphere scatters sunlight especially the blue light which makes it look bright and blue okay let's speed up here I think I, I'm gonna full screen this just to maximize the edges let's speed up time this is something they can do in the planetarium if you go on a planetarium night 
to do your observing activity. Everything moves in the sky. Sun, stars, even the planets, which weren't separately listed on that voting question you just did, and moon and distant galaxies, which we could zoom in on the sky and see distant galaxies back there somewhere. Mostly a stellarium. Shows stars, though, from this zoom view. Uh, so by the way, the answer to the voting question you just did, I think the, there were four objects listed, so it was all four. I always like to verify what the right answer was. So it should have been D, all four. Let's look in the different cardinal directions real quick. This is set to, by default, point south. But let's look over to the east. I'm just going to drag my view over to the left. Notice stuff, stars, planets, and eventually the sun rise in the general direction of east, but not all exactly due east. Oh, there comes the sun. See, it's a little bit south of east in the wintertime. Not a coincidence. In the summertime, it'll be a little bit north of east. OK, now let's glance over to the west to see the opposite happening. Stuff, everything, rises in, toward the east, sets toward the west. Not all exactly due west, but generally toward the west. Some a little north of, some a little south of. And for an observer in the northern hemisphere like us, it tends to get high in the southern sky and progress from east to west over the course of a day. Now let's look toward the north. And here it looks like stuff is moving in a circle. And that's not a coincidence. It looks like there's a spinning motion going on because Earth is spinning. And from our perspective, standing still on a spinning Earth, we think we're fixed. It looks like the sky is spinning. But we know it's really Earth that's spinning. And if you look carefully, there's a particular direction in the sky that doesn't appear to be spinning. It appears to be the center that everything is spinning around. And it's right about here. It's not exactly the center, but that star that I'm pointing at is really close to what everything appears to be spinning around. It's pure coincidence that there happens to be a star close to that spot in the sky. That spot in the sky is actually right next to the star. This star is called Polaris, the North Star. It's called Polaris because Earth's pole, the axis of rotation, just happens to point at it. And I think if I zoom out here, it might be more apparent that everything oops, appears to be spinning around Polaris. Cool, crazy fisheye view, huh? Really lets you zoom out. So that explains why things appear to be rising in the east, coming high in the southern sky. Well, not all high in the southern sky. That star didn't get very high in the southern sky but kind of marching across the southern sky and setting it roughly in the direction of west. Toward the north, they appear to be making counterclockwise circles around Polaris. All right, I'm going to unfull screen this. There, I'm going to stop that. It just makes me nervous. OK. okay. And I'll probably come back to Stellarium in a few minutes. I'm going to show you some pictures now. <coughs> Here, instead of an animation or simulation, is a real photograph. It was taken with a time exposure. A bit longer than default. <coughs> Anybody like more time? OK. Prepare your votes. Three, two, one, vote. OK. You see in a mix, maybe two or three more popular answers. One minute is not a very popular answer. And I'll go ahead and have you guys rule that one out right now. It's not one minute. If the sky appeared to be spinning that fast, we would be dizzy all the time, and we're not. But I see a mix of answers 
for the other options. So here's what we're going to do. I got everyone who wanted to opt in to having their name in the hat. Um, I'm not going to draw your names right now. I want to give you a chance to talk to your neighbor, one or more neighbors, confer, share reasoning with them, and try to come to an answer and then uh, and have your explanation ready. And then I will draw names from a hat after you get to talk. So take 30 seconds to talk. We'll revote and draw names. Go. Five more seconds. Okay. First, let's do our revote because I'm curious which way the general feeling has shifted, and then we'll hear some explanations. So prepare your cards. Three, two, one, vote. Okay, well, we still have three popular answers. And thank, a special thank you to those of you who are voting like this, because it shows me that um, there is some serious confusion out there that I should address. So the C, D, and E are the more popular answers I'm seeing, not quite as many Bs. Uh, so I'm going to draw names, and hopefully, we will hear explanations supporting more than one of those answers so I can hear what people are thinking. The value of doing this is that I'm hearing not just from whoever's name I call and whoever speaks, but from the people you talked to around you. All right, so speak up nice and loud. Um, and when I call your name, you can either tell me an answer if you were fairly confident in uh, you and your group, um, whatever your reasoning was, even if you are not confident, that's fine. Or if you want to tell me an answer option that you eliminated and you didn't really sort out between the ones that were remaining, that's fine too. Let's hear from Tristan Frim and group. Tristan? I'll give you another moment. All right, no Tristan today? Oh, that's too bad. Let's hear from, I'm trying to skip around in the alphabet here. Eric McGrother and group. Okay, thank you, Eric and group. I always like to hear from at least three groups to get a sense of the room. Let's hear from Bill Clark and group. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Bill. And let's hear from Cole Scopetto. Uh, yeah, group. I put D as well. Uh, it looks like the smallest one in the middle is on the top layer. Um, the center of the top is the first across the two layers. Okay. So we heard some explanations for something in the 6 to 12 hour range. Can anyone offer whether or not your group picked 30 minutes or 24 hours, offer an explanation for what others might have been thinking for 30 minutes or 24 hours? OK. Well, there weren't as many votes for those. There were probably more votes for C and D. And 
the correct answer, the best answer is six hours, somewhere in the six to eight hour range perhaps, um, but eight hours wasn't an option, only six hours was. And the reason is the streaks here, if you find an individual streak, it starts and ends, and look at what fraction of the full circle it takes up, because you told me last time it takes 24 hours to, for Earth to spin all the way around on its axis, which means the stars should appear to go all the way around in the sky in 24 hours, and so whatever fraction of 24 hours um, is visibly seen here as whatever fraction of the full circle. And so about a quarter or a third of a circle, I think by, by this one it looks like a quarter of a circle, so that's why I think six hours is the best answer. And it doesn't matter which star streak on that photograph you look at. They all should subtend a quarter of their full circle. Sure, this streak toward the middle is smaller, but that's just because it's closer to the center and so it's got a smaller radius and hence a smaller circumference. It's still one quarter of its full circle. This streak over here, uh, we can't see the whole thing because it is hidden below the horizon, but if we could see the whole thing, that would also be one quarter of its full circle. So each streak here corresponds to one star, and it's about a quarter of a day, so six hours. I wanted to define, I put this up here to remind myself to define diurnal motion. Diurnal means of or pertaining to a day. And in astronomy, that means daily cycles, things that happen on a 24-hour cycle. In biology, they talk about diurnal animals as being the opposite of nocturnal, as in awake during the day. Humans are largely diurnal creatures, but that's not quite the definition we mean in astronomy. It's not just things that have happened during the day when the sun is up, it's things over the 24-hour cycle. And these, this photograph that I am showing you, and I'll show you two more examples, is sometimes referred to as a star trails photo, which you just need a stable mount, like a tripod or something, and a time exposure. And you get these cool streaks, and they trace out perfect circles, or portions thereof, and if you have a short exposure time, then you get short streaks. But even with a really short exposure, you can already pinpoint where the center of all those circles is. It's roughly there. And the ones farther away appear to be moving faster because they've got a bigger circle to trace out in 24 hours. But it's always a 360 degree, angularly speaking, circle. Longer exposure time, longer streaks. How long would the exposure for this picture take? Any ideas? What do you think? 24 hours? 24 hours? What were you going to say? Same? It would be uh, more like longer. Or longer than 24. Yeah, after the circle's complete, they'll just repeat. And so it could be anything longer than 24 hours. Um, this, it turns out, is a Photoshop job. How can you tell? There's something weird about this photo. There's something just not quite right. Go ahead. There's no stars in the corners. No stars in the corners. Okay, yeah, they do kind of, there's some really faint streaks here, and it looks like they get fainter and fainter. What else? What do you think? Too bright when the sun is out, with the rising and setting. What were you going to say? There's just like more daytime in the 24 hours, or more blocks daytime. Yep. No daytime in this 24 hour or more time interval, and that wouldn't happen. There actually, it is possible for locations on Earth to go more than 24 hours without daylight if you're above the Arctic Circle or below the Antarctic Circle during their respective winter times. But the sky would look different, and we'll talk about that more later today and into next time when we talk about latitude dependence. It turns out these, this photo could not have been taken from above the Arctic Circle or below the Antarctic Circle because if it had um, the center of those 
circles would be straight up or close to straight up above and not close to the horizon as shown here. And you might also argue that there are no castles above the Arctic Circle. I'm not sure quite how far up Norway goes, but if they have castles up in the hinterlands. But anyway, um, we're going to tie all that together when we talk about latitude dependence. Yeah, the sun would come up for any other latitude on Earth during 24-hour period. That's all I want to say about star trails. So photos like these star trails show the sky above us, in other words, above our horizon that we can see in the 180 degrees from horizon to horizon and 360 degrees around. But the sky actually surrounds Earth in all directions. above and below, even though above and below aren't defined in space, there's not really an up and a down. We, on the Earth, define a north and a south, but wherever you're standing on Earth, even if you're not at the North Pole or the South Pole, even if you're standing at the equator, when you're standing there, up for you is just above your head. And the part of the sky that you can see is above your horizon, the part that you can't because it's below the Earth is not necessarily connected to north and south. So it is useful to imagine the sky surrounding Earth in all directions, not just up. And a celestial sphere, the full three-dimensional sphere, <coughs> is often used to describe this motion of how the sky appears to be skin spinning around us. We know it's not the sky that's spinning, it's Earth that's spinning. And I have an animation of that here. Just looking at this leftmost pane here, we know that it's Earth that's spinning. But now we're going to pretend for the purpose of answering some questions about predicting how things should move over the course of a day, we're going to pretend that it's the sky and the celestial sphere spinning. And the celestial sphere, we imagine, spins on the same axis that pierces through the Earth's north and south pole. And so there's a corresponding, if you imagine projecting the Earth's north and south pole up to the celestial sphere, a corresponding north celestial pole. It's a spot on the sky. That's where the North Star happens to be. And they corresponding the opposite south celestial pole. They're projections from the Earth poles. And we pretend that the stars are like glued on to this imaginary celestial sphere, which is very wrong for several reasons, not the least of which is stars are actually all at very different distances from us. And the celestial sphere kind of pretends that they're all on a curved surface, and they're not. And nonetheless, it will still prove useful. Now let's get more egocentric and turn the celestial sphere so that what looks like up in the diagram is above the head of the observer at some location that we imagine they're standing on Earth. So we're not going to put the North Celestial Pole up. We're going to put the observer standing straight up. So this is for an observer standing at a mid-northern latitude, like in continental United States or Asia or Europe. So here's my observer. We're just going to turn this whole thing. so. Up is up for them. And then if we want to get even more egocentric, we'll chop off the bottom half of the part of the celestial sphere that they can't see. And to animate that, you can see on the right here, this is what the sky looks like for them. And this will connect to what we saw the stars doing in our Stellarium demo earlier. Stars appear to rise roughly in the direction of east, swing across the southern sky, set roughly in the direction of west, and they appear to make counterclockwise circles around the north celestial pole, which is shown here with this blue 
tick. And there's the observer. This is their flat horizon plane. Um, to show you why that is drawn the way it is, imagine here the white dot represents the observer's location. Imagine now the observer being small compared to the size of the Earth, and the Earth curvature is not noticeable for us tiny beings living on this large Earth. And so the ground appears to be flat, so we envision it as flat and a plane extending from kind of where our feet touch the ground all the way out. And so this is the perspective shift that the diagram in the animation is taking from the outside view of an observer standing on Earth to the observer's own view of their horizon and the sky above them. And we can even turn off the sky below them to just show what they see at any given moment. Okay, so this is a certain use of the celestial sphere to show what an observer sees at any given moment, and then the paths of the, some sample stars in the sky going around with the spinning celestial sphere are shown here, actually three different stars. There's star A, which appears to rise back here, set up here, and then it's below the horizon for half the day. And then star B, ooh, notice star B. Doesn't actually cross the horizon. And this is another star, the North Star Polaris, which happens to be, by pure luck, where the celestial, close to where the celestial pole is on the sky. And by the way, we're Northern Hemisphere residents here in the continental US. Well, heck, in all of the parts of the US, even Hawaii and Alaska are in the Northern Hemisphere. So we tend to talk about the North Celestial Pole being up in the sky, but if you were in the Southern Hemisphere, the South Celestial Pole would be up in your sky. And we can actually show that on this Rotating Sky Explorer, which is a really handy tool I encourage you to use when you're answering homework questions about this and studying. You can take the observer to a different spot on Earth. Let's put them here in South America. And now the South Celestial Pole would be up in their sky. And now all of the stars would appear to be making clockwise circles around the South Celestial Pole. And that's true anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. And notice that the South Celestial Pole would be off in the direction of South in their sky, whereas if we were in the Northern Hemisphere, the North Celestial Pole is off in the direction of North in their sky. So good, South and North have some meaning. And Lastly, I'll say it doesn't matter what longitude you're at. It only matters what latitude you're at, how far north and south. OK, and we will say more about latitude a bit later. But I wanted to familiarize you with this tool. It really summarizes everything we're going to talk about diurnal motions. OK, that's a lot. Let us take a two-minute break so you can stretch your legs. Have a little breather, and then we'll come back and do some practice questions on diurnal motion. OK, let's come back together. Now we're going to connect the diurnal motions with cardinal directions. I might have dimmed the lights just a bit. OK. <clears throat> I don't have multiple choice options up there, so we can't vote with the cards. But go ahead and vote by just saying if you know what the answer is. What direction is that? I heard a few people murmur north. North is the correct answer, but you have to make some assumptions to answer that. You have to, namely, assume that the picture was taken from the continental US, and that's Arches National Park in Utah, so that is, or it's not in the, I should, sorry, not in the continental US. You have to assume that it's taken north of the equator, 
and it happens to be taken from the continental US in Arches National Park in Utah. So yes, north of the equator is, turns out to be true. Um, but if the picture had been taken from the southern hemisphere, the center of all those star trails circles would be the south celestial pole, and the picture would be taken facing south. But since it was taken from the northern hemisphere, it is the north celestial pole and not the south celestial pole, and therefore the observer must have been facing north. And you can also deduce what directions are on the sides if we're assuming northern hemisphere facing north, then point in the direction that would be east. It's going to be left or right. Go ahead and point. Correct, if you're pointing right. If you're facing north, east is on your right, west is on your left. I have lived in the US all my life, and so I always think Canada, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean. I imagine I'm looking at a map of the US. And if north is up or in front of me, then east is to the right, west is to the left. This is also consistent with a word that I spoke in passing before, which I will now draw your attention to. I said all the star trails, circles, the stars appear to be making counterclockwise circles around the north celestial pole. It's also evident in this diagram. If you put yourself in the observer's perspective, they're looking up at this sky, they see star B making a counterclockwise circle around the North Star. And if they could imagine the whole circle of star A, if it were all above the horizon, it would also be going counterclockwise around the North Star. And it's not an accident. It's because Earth spins counterclockwise on its axis. And so if you're standing in the northern hemisphere of this counterclockwise spinning Earth, then the sky will appear to spin counterclockwise around you. You can demonstrate this next time you're sitting in a spinning, a spinny chair or just standing up and you can rotate counterclockwise. The sky will, the whole room will appear to rotate counterclockwise around some point directly above your head. If you were looking down at your feet instead, imagine looking through a transparent horizon, transparent earth down to the south celestial pole, then all the objects in the room would appear to move clockwise around you when you're spinning counterclockwise. But if you look up to the north, they would appear to go counterclockwise. So using that information to analyze this picture, all the star trails should be going this way, counterclockwise, and that matches with something we said earlier, that stars rise toward the east and set toward the west. So you can connect the celestial sphere with cardinal directions and the counterclockwise rotation of Earth on its axis from a north-centric perspective, we say <clears throat> that the Earth is spinning counterclockwise. Um, a couple other things to say about cardinal directions. Cardinal directions are defined along the horizon for the observer. So the horizon is shown in this picture as this kind of slightly darker but still light gray flat bottom to this hemisphere. And so all the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, are defined along that. If we had the north star somewhere up in our sky, oh gosh, I don't know which direction is north in reality here. I guess I could get out the compass on my phone. But um, let's just say for concrete example, if north were that way on my compass, then Polaris would be, well, it would be higher up in the sky than that. But anyway, if I wanted to point or walk in the direction of north, I would not point up into the sky, nor could I walk up into the sky. I would go along my horizon, and I would say that direction is north. So the reason that Polaris is a useful direction-finding star and nicknamed the North Star, is that it is always in the sky along the direction of north. If you imagine dropping down an imaginary line to the horizon, the north is the most directly underneath it. Um, oh, maybe I should have put it on that side of the room 
because they're in a diagram, Polaris is off to the left. So anyway, so cardinal directions are along the horizon. Polaris, since the axis of rotation points at it, never moves in the sky. So if you can find Polaris in the sky and you're a sailor out on the ocean, you know always which direction is north and you can work out the other directions from that. Questions so far? I will try to remember to pause to invite questions, but feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to remember to look up if you have questions as we're going, even if I don't pause. I want to take your questions. Okay, we're going to do some activities, a minute paper and a worksheet, but before we do that, I want to give you a chance to collect your thoughts, maybe glance back at your notes. I hope you're taking notes and think about what some of the main points are. And that will be the topic of our, for our minute paper for today. So make sure to use a paper from the back of your workbook if you have your workbook. If you don't have your workbook on any given day, we're going to do a minute paper every day, come down to the front before class and grab one of our spare minute papers. Never use notebook paper. Um, if you haven't done that yet but you need to borrow one, just raise your hand. And I'll ask Allison and Hannah to take some for you. Minute papers are generally not graded for correctness. It's an opportunity for you, in this case, to reflect. Sometimes we'll use them to predict, other times to give personal examples of applying astronomy concepts. Now take another few moments and make sure that the things you're listing are not just the words from our to-do list, but make each of your three points into a grammatically complete sentence or long phrase, like actually conveying some information about what you learned about these things. A definition of a term, something that's happening in space. Then it will be more useful to you. Okay, I collect minute papers and I don't generally give them back. So if you would like a record of what you wrote, you can either, oh, I want to start, you can either jot it down in your notes or take a quick picture with your phone. You can put flipped on a break, it'll let you go away for 10 seconds and come back. Um, and then when you're done, pass your paper to the aisle so I, we can collect them. Make sure your name is on it so if today's minute paper is randomly chosen for uh, participation credit, then I'll be able to assign your credit. Mm -hmm.
you're not quite finished yet, that's okay. Uh, the LAs will go up and down the aisle twice, so you can catch them on the next pass. Raise your hand if you still need more time. Okay, a few more people. No problem. Meanwhile, if you are done, you can start preparing your card to answer this question. Would anybody like more time before answering this question? Okay, prepare your votes. Three, two, one, vote. Okay, pretty good agreement here. How many hours is the right answer? Twelve, Twelve is correct. It's half of its full star trail circle. Now let's answer the question for star B. Anybody like more time? Three, two, one, vote. Okay, how many hours for star B? Twelve, Twelve again. Yeah, because every star takes 24 hours to complete a full star trail circle. Again, we have this animation of that motion in the Rotating Sky Explorer, and star B would be something like, let's see, will let me change the perspective a little bit. Let me turn on the star trails. So star B might be something like this star right here. And of course, this is sped up but it would take 24 hours to go all the way around. Oh, notice that star B, like some of the other stars in the sky, the ones that are close to the celestial pole, they are in what's called the circumpolar region, which means their full star trail falls above the horizon for this observer. Star A is in a region where at least part of its star trail falls below the horizon, and that is the rise and set region here, which will be highlighted in light gray. Let me dim the lights so you can see these regions better. So in pink, that's the circumpolar region. Polaris is right smack at the center of the circumpolar region. And look, the Big Dipper is right on the edges of the circumpolar region, mostly within the circumpolar region. So the Big Dipper is a convenient constellation for us Northern Hemisphere residents, because uh, we're at a high enough latitude that the Big Dipper is um, visible in the sky any time of year, at least some part of the night. And, um, sorry, any time of year, every night, it'll be somewhere in the sky, because it's always in the sky also in the sky during the daytime, but we can't see the stars during the daytime because the sky is bright. It's always in the sky. It's also handy for pointing at Polaris because the two stars on the bowl of the dipper point. Here, let's look at it uh, over here. Oh, I guess it's not showing the big dipper on this. Oh, yes, it is. There it is. There it is. Notice that the two stars in the bowl of the dipper point at Polaris. So if you can't recognize Polaris immediately upon glancing at the sky, which I can't because it's just kind of an average looking, not particularly bright star, uh, then find the Big Dipper and use that to point to Polaris. Then the last region on here, just for completeness sake, I might as well highlight. And I'll show the underside of the horizon diagram. There we go. Uh, the one that's the opposite of the circumpolar region is the never rise region. SARS in this part of the sky will never be visible to this observer any day, any time of the year. 
but they could be visible and would be visible for observers in the southern hemisphere. Notice that the relative fraction of the sky comprising these three regions varies based on the observer's latitude. If you're at the equator, there's no circumpolar region and no never rise region. It's all rise set. And if you're at the pole, it's all circumpolar or never rise and no rise set. And if you're in the somewhere in between, you have different fractions in the different regions. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, same deal. It's just that the southern celestial pole is up in your sky instead of the north. Cool. All right, so this will help you with some of the homework questions. Now let's do a few more practice. Questions now connecting that back to the cardinal directions. I think that's the last dark picture or animation I wanted to show, so I'm going to turn the lights up one last time here. And by the way, raise your hand if you still have a minute paper you have yet to turn in so we make sure we get all those. Okay, just hand it to the aisle if convenient or hold it out. Thank you. I'll give you a visual hint on this one before we vote. The diagram from the previous questions. <coughs> Anybody like more time? Prepare your votes. Three, two, one, vote. We're split. The two most popular answers I see are northern and southern with a smattering of eastern, western, and the rainbow. So here is a worksheet that will help you figure this out. It's on page five and six. And here are the general instructions for working on worksheets. Always work with a partner. Groups of two are ideal. Groups of three are fine. You will learn more if you work with a partner. If that really bothers you, I won't force you, but I strongly encourage it for your learning. When you're explaining something to someone else, you are learning more, and so are they. All right, we don't have much time. Get as far as you can on this one. We may not finish it in class. That's OK. Anything you don't finish in class, finish on your own outside. But I want to give you some work time so you have less homework. Write your answers in your own workbook. Talk with your partner to confer on your reasoning, but you should write them up separately.
Raise your hand if you're on the second page, page six. OK, cool. Anyone done? OK, keep working. We'll check some answers together in a moment. Oh, let's check some answers now. We've only got three minutes left. OK, first, let's check question nine. Even if you didn't get that far, question nine is key for answering the questions below it and for answering the question that we just did with the voting cards. So question nine asks you to label the directions. And so everybody, for this diagram here, imagine this is the same as what you're looking at on page five, your diagram. Point in the direction that, don't, don't answer the question here, I, I, I should say. Look at your figure one on page five. Imagine that's up on the screen in front of us. Point which direction would be north. With your arm right now, go ahead and point. OK, so here's the trick. Remember, north is not up in the sky to Polaris. North is along the horizon. So that's north. And so south would be which direction? Again, not in the sky, not down into the ground, along the horizon. Your horizon plane is parallel to the ground. Um, and if this is figure one in front of you like this, point in the direction that would be east. Into the page, yes, into the page. So west would be out of the page behind you. Okay, that can help with this question that we did just prior to starting the workbook page. So let's answer this one together. Oh, sorry. This is the question leading up to the one we did just prior to the workbook. Um, you all already answered north, south, east, and west. So what direction is that little cartoon guy facing? Go ahead and say it out loud. North. He's pointing at the North Star, but his feet are in the direction of north. Now let's redo this pre-workbook voting question. Prepare your cards. Three, two, one, vote. A little uncertainty. OK, maybe I didn't give people enough time to think about it. Well, let's step through it in two steps together. Which star could it be that the observer sees rising due east? Star A or star B? Has to be star A, because that's where it rises at its position one in the direction of due east into the page. Star B is never due east. It's always up in the sky. <coughs> so star A, when it reaches its highest position, it's at position 2. And what direction is that? Well, if that's north, that's south. It's high in the southern sky. Should be high in the southern sky. Fun fact. Now, I am going to collect three workbooks for giving you feedback. Not for grading harshly for correctness, but it's purely to help you. So Anastasia Polakovsky, Michaela Reed, and Hope Seiler. Leave your workbooks with me. I'll bring them back for you next time. Everyone else, take your workbook. Finish it on your own if you're not finished. And I'll see you Thursday. <laughs>